enough time. We'll welcome everybody uh, to the Center for Middle Eastern Studies for this special event titled Istanbul, Living with Difference in a Global City. And we're delighted to have our two guests, the two uh, co-editors of the book with us today. Nora Fisher Onar is Assistant Professor of Global Politics at Coastal and Carolina University. She also serves as a research associate for the Center of International Studies at Oxford University and as a non-residential fellow of the German Marshall Fund. Her research interests include international relations and social theory, comparative area studies, gender, history, memory, and foreign policy analysis. She received her doctorate in international relations from Oxford and holds master's and undergraduate degrees from Johns Hopkins and Georgetown Universities, respectively. Uh, Fuad Kleiman is director of the Istanbul Policy Center and professor of international relations at Sabanchi University in Istanbul. He works on democratization, globalization, international relations, civil society, and Turkey-European Union relations. Uh, both are actually the author, authors of many books and articles, uh, which I won't go into now because we want to focus on this. Their most recent publication, Istanbul, Living with Difference in a Global City. So please, uh, everybody, join me in the warm welcome to Martha Sharonar and Fuad Kim. volume via my introduction to it, um, and then Paul will pick up from there with a more general assessment of dynamics in Turkey today, and Istanbul today. <clears throat> now the volume brings together an interdisciplinary group of scholars uh, around the question, what does a city like Istanbul teach us about living with difference? And um, this is a question that uh, we believe is relevant not just to Turkey, where uh, polarization is both deeply rooted and uh, in a, a historic ties uh, in the present juncture, um, but also a challenge that confronts societies across the globe as populist politicians exploit cleavages towards advancing liberal agendas and the consolidation of their own power by trying to cross the global south and north alike. Um, so we thought that this was a, a ripe opportunity to ask the question how does sharing space uh, enable people to perhaps thrive, uh, even um, living amongst those uh, whose hopes jostle against their own? Um, and in this regard, Istanbul is an age-old but ultra-modern megacity. is both the hub of empire, for millennia and the quintessential lines of Europe and Asia, uh, is a particularly relevant site for asking how to look together in diversity, uh, because it enables three analytical moves, all of which push back against the binary thinking that so often straight, uh, straight jackets are um, thought in practice. Um, in other words, Istanbul and emerging global cities in general are useful sites of analysis because they exist, to begin with, methodological nationalism. And this is perhaps the most obvious claim uh, that I'm going to make. Uh, the, the municipal level of analysis allows one to hone in on dynamics at the interplay of transnational, regional, and local uh, forces and interactions. Um, and one can build in national and international uh, considerations, depending on the empirical question in hands, but it doesn't uh, bind you to a state-centric story. Um, second, Istanbul, like other world historical slash up-and-coming cities, Cape Town, Hong Kong, Mumbai, Shanghai, are promising sites for challenging methodological Eurocentrism. Uh, they reveal historical sources, textures, and uh, trajectories that um, uh, of, of urban modernity that are far richer, arguably, than uh, in many of their counterparts in the West. Um, and last but not least, uh, cities like Istanbul can help to challenge what I elsewhere call methodological Occidentalism, the reification in the global south, especially by populist nationalists, of non-Western difference. Um, this is a trap that I believe faces analysts uh, sympathetic to the post colonial agenda like myself. Um, uh, because, however emancipatory it may be to uncover non Western norms and forms of social and political order, in so doing, we're also producing a set of intellectual resources which can be harnessed towards non Western hegemonic projects, uh, which also do violence. And cities are great sites for challenging hegemonic narratives of all stripes because they present us with emplaced encounters and entanglements. It forced the analysts to confront the mutual constitution in 2018 of putatively Western and putatively non-Western ideas and practices. So having said that, um, I turn to Istanbul per se 
is a site of continuous habitation for eight millennia and a city of some 14 million souls today. Um, Istanbul is with exceptional geocultural traction. Uh, it has long been portrayed as the proverbial bridge between land masses, civilization, security communities. Um, it's kind of, it's almost a cliche to say, you know, it, it bridges east and west, north and south, Europe and Middle East, Islam, etc. Um, but while Istanbul as such offers almost endless narrative possibilities, I argue in my introduction to the volume that there are really two stories today um, that are vying for ownership of the city's soul. And these two stories have a lot in common and are aligned in many regards, but they also diverge in some important ways. Um, now, uh, to begin with, they share a nostalgia for the Ottoman period, the challenges of the unitary ethno-nationalism of Kemalism, whose champions in the 1920s abandoned Istanbul's imperial confluence of waters and peoples to found a brave new nation state in Arid Ankara. And while there is a burgeoning post kemalist imaginary of Islam as well, which celebrates the city's 1930s, 40s, and 50s as a site of westernist modernity, Kemalists mostly conjured up the nation states via Ankara. So by pushing back against this Ankara-centric national project, the two neo-Ottoman visions of the city serve as municipal come national imaginaries in that they provide a reservoir of reference from the Ottoman era with which to champion a new collective identity in which Istanbul is read as a microcosmic of Turkey as a whole. A second arena in which these two neo-Ottoman imaginaries overlap is in the proponents, the city's capital and intelligentsia, uh, who embrace uh, neoliberalism by the neo-Ottomanism uh, because uh, they um, uh, capital and intelligentsia are indeed the winners from uh, globalization and like to see the city consolidate its position on the network with the global cities um, and use Ottomanist references as a resource in, uh, towards this end. A third over overlapping element is that both frames excavate from Ottoman history an ethical framework towards answering our broad question, how to live together in diversity. Um, so there's a lot of overlap and individuals may be caught up in multiple modes of both appropriating and subverting these two uh, neo-Ottoman communal liberal narratives. Um, however, they're also differentiated in important ways. And so, uh, one of these stories is what I call Bel Epoch Istanbul. Um, and this is touted by uh, liberal offshoots of the old secular ruling class. Uh, as the name suggests, Bel Epoch Istanbul attends to the relatively recent long 19th century. It is commodified in multiple ways, evident, for example, in the regentrification of historic recreational and port districts like Beyoğlu and Karakay, for those of you familiar with Istanbul. Um, this temporal locus in the long 19th century uh, celebrates the meeting of a westernizing Ottoman Empire with European modernities. It also has meant rediscovering the lost non-Muslim communities, who on the eve of World War I numbered in the mil millions and who are reduced to less than 100,000 today. Um, so by celebrating these communities' contributions to Istanbul's modernization as the empire's first bourgeoisie, the uh, Belle Epoque reference enables identification with the non-Muslim West, while also, problematically, as one of the chapters in our uh, volume argues, eliding responsibility for actually what happened to the non-Muslims, because if you celebrate their memory, then how can you be responsible for their extirpation? Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, the Belle Epoque frame entails a formula for celebrating pluralism as liberal cosmopolitanism. Um, and this has been leveraged in recent decades towards engagement of traditionally marginalized groups in Turkey, uh, ethnic, religious, and sectarian minorities, as well as gender minorities. Um, and it's also authorized outreach to the Sunni majority, um, with Sunni preferences envisaged as one more expression of diversity to be governed by secular multiculturalism. But that's not the only marriage of Islam. Um, uh, so there's a second story um, that is uh, arguably emerged as the most, that is the triumphal one at this particular uh, world historic moment. Um, and that is the Ottoman Islamic narrative of the empire's golden age. And this is celebrated by the new pro-religious ruling class in its grassroots. The story celebrates the Ottoman glory days, from the conquest or Fethi of Istanbul by Mehmet the Conqueror in 1452, through to the zenith of Ottoman expansion and the Suleiman the Magnificent, the lawgiver in the 16th century, and well into the early modern era or the, of the Tula period of the 18th century, when there was engagement of Europe, but the diffusion of ideas and civilizations, as emphasized in the narrative, was Ottoman-centric, not Eurocentric. Um, so this reading of Ottoman Islamic Istanbul emphasizes the city's role as a site of authenticity rather than a site of syncretism. And part of that authenticity, at least in variants of the Ottoman Islamic imaginary, entail a formula for living with diversity, living, uh, for living with difference. 
um, which is I call neo millet in character. Um, so for those of you uh, not familiar with the millet system, this was a form of multi-communitarian legal pluralism, which the Ottoman used to manage the empire's staggering diversity uh, by allowing all Muslims, all Christians, and all Jews to be governed by their own religious rules and communal terms, um, while authorizing Muslim primacy and the Sultan's ultimate authority. So a neo millet formula, formula uh, for living with difference today would entail toleration and cohabitation of different groups, but it's also hierarchical and paternalistic, favoring Sunni Muslims. And this has been used to frame outreach to um, the country's uh, minuscule remaining non-Muslim minorities, some of whom have, have thrown their weight full behind this Ottoman Islamic uh, project, you're very imagining the city and the national project. Um, it also underwrites outreach to Kurds and visages fellow Muslims who merely speak a different language. Um, so this was the logic behind the now defunct peace process uh, in which uh, Bobbe uh, can participate and can, can tell us more about for us. Um, however, like all good stories, the Ottoman Islamic narrative is plastic and can and is increasingly appropriated towards a, an ethno-religious Turkish Islam synthesis, um, which can be quite combative. Um, and this, of course, alienates secular as well as religious minorities. So, where do those claims uh, of, uh, to the city of those groups uh, whose, whose aspirations may not mesh well either with the liberal cosmopolitanism of the Belipa formula or the um, neo-millet uh, approach to living in diversity of the Ottoman Islamic formula, where do they fit in? And here again, the city just offers an exceptional resource um, with its daily parade of what I call actually existing conviviality. Um, Istanbul, after all, is the paradigmatic uh, cosmopolis, the old Istanbul like room or Greek uh, way of saying citizens of the world by a citizenship of the city. Um, and in this regard, Istanbul anchors a sort of emic cosmopolitanism um, that is not necessarily beholden to either liberal or neo militant logics. Um, it showcases, for example, the cosmopolit, these are Turkish rendering, uh, energies of subaltern and multi diasporic um, modes of sharing the city among economic migrants from within Turkey, to be sure, um, but also transnationally from the Caucasus, Central Asia, the Middle East, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and it's evident energy is radiated by refugees, who Istanbul has a long tradition of hosting, from Sephardic Jews in the 15th century, Polish officers in the 19th century, the white Russians and distant Germans in the early 20th century, and of course the very large Syrian contingent today, all groups who impact interactions in the city and leave traces even when they move on. We see it also in gendered intersections, with women's everyday experiences across the cityscape, a false sight of negotiating coexistence with diverse others. We see it indeed in the explicit activism of the women's movement, which regularly confronts the challenge of mobilizing across identity cleavages between women, across Kurdish, Islamic, Kemalist, and liberal leftist feminist uh, programs, in order to bring thousands of women onto the city streets, um, as they have poured out in recent, many times in recent years, for overlapping uh, towards advancing overlapping visions of empowerment. And this leads me to Istanbul as a state of not just actually existing commonality, but also of explicitly political performance, a prison through which one can and I do tell the story of the social movements and electoral contests on the city stage over the past five years. So for those of you familiar with Turkey, these include protests to bring to justice the killers of Trump Dink, a liberal Armenian Turkish journalist, um, uh, the cause that has been unrequited, um, Istanbul's magnificent pride parades, uh, which are now banned. Um, the Green Green Coalition, as it were, of uh, anti-capitalist Muslim youth movement um, and the environmentalist movement, which coalesced in the context of the Gibbs Park protest. Um, and on the Ottoman Islamic side of the equation, groups like an Anatolian youth movement, which seek the reconversion of Hagia Sophia, the great monument, into a mosque, as a man who truly pushes the envelope of the Ottoman Islamic narrative in Islam. Now, the standing question, of course, is what will become of these movements and energies at a time when the state appears to have co-opted the more belligerent rendering of Ottoman Islamic triumphalism and is reasserting its power over the city um, with all of its considerable might. Um, we see this, for example, in the reconfiguration today of Istanbul's skyline, its iconic skyline, um, uh, and its central squares uh, in the form of new mega mosques um, that have been built in recent years. Um, but perhaps the final gift that world historic and global cities like Istanbul give us um, is that they demonstrate that through the ages, uh, cities can anchor and enliven pluralism regardless of the best efforts to eliminate diversity by states, imperial, national, or otherwise. Um, so just to conclude, the uh, chapters in the volume um, all uh, address this question of how to live together in diversity. 
um, uh, contributors hailed from uh, the humanities and humanistic social sciences, so political sociology, political history, political theory, anthropology, geography, religious studies, and sociology. Um, and they address, uh, if you are interested in uh, purchasing the volume, <laughs> we, have, uh, we have flyers here with a, a discount as well. Um, they address stories ranging from uh, late Ottoman cosmopolitanism, including what contributor Sam Zubeda calls its uh, promiscuous variants in the form of Masonic and drinking cultures in late 19th and 20th century Istanbul. Um, they address the troubled histories and memories of the city's non-Muslim communities. They address both the everyday and eminently political practices of women, the experience of migrants, and the challenges and accomplishments of the city's environmentalist and LGBTQ activists. Um, so, without further ado, I will. Thank you, Nora, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting us and having us uh, here. What I like to do is uh, to share with you my take on Istanbul uh, <coughs> as I try to, to, to uh, put forward in the foreword of the, of the, the book. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I like to start with the other book that I've been reading recently on Istanbul uh, by uh, Bethany Hughes, uh, Istanbul, The Tale of uh, Christies. It's a very big book and, uh, and it talks about the development of Istanbul in a very historical way and ends in 1923 uh, when the Turkish Republic was declared as an independent nation state after the National Independence War. And uh, in this uh, bulky book, uh, which I recommend, uh, uh, Bethany talks about uh, three Istanbuls. Istanbul as Byzantium, Istanbul as Constantinople, and Istanbul as Istanbul. And, and, and all of these actually uh, historical uh, trajectory and historical development, Istanbul has always been an extremely important port, capital, bridge, uh, and geographical uh, and geopolitical, geoeconomical uh, loca location. And uh, the, the recent uh, constructions uh, to build the metro in Istanbul uh, sort of unearthed uh, some archaeological uh, products that indicated that the history of Istanbul goes back to uh, 8,000 BC, which was 5,000 BC before in our museums and everything. And every time that there is a construction going on in Istanbul, in this neoliberal reconstruction, process, uh, Istanbul's history goes back. And now we can talk about Istanbul going back to 8,000 uh, 8, BC. And we are talking about uh, sort of a city, the queen of, uh, as she puts it, uh, three empires. It's always uh, sort of a center of the empire. And it's actually quite important in the development of, of, of world history. So uh, from, from that, uh, we could actually suggest that it's a very historical city. When we talk about Istanbul, we are talking about history. And at the same time, of course, uh, you know, when we talk about Istanbul, uh, we are talking about a very modern city. So it's a kind of a, a you know, <coughs> examples of uh, modernity. But uh, in recent uh, research on modernity indicates Istanbul represents not one modernity, but uh, many modernities. It is the kind of uh, you know, the, the intersection of, uh, of multiple identities, multiple entries into, 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 into modernity. And that's why in the Ottoman times, uh, Istanbul was uh, a kind of an example of how uh, <coughs> difference uh, was negotiated uh, in a given space through what we call the millet system. Uh, in, in the book, uh, we actually uh, kind of uh, uh, discussed that whether that kind of negotiating uh, difference uh, in a communitarian way uh, could pr produce cosmopolitan or some other kind of uh, living together arrangement. And as a matter of fact, uh, we never actually seen uh, sort of cosmopolitanism there, but, but there is always an attempt uh, to uh, uh, provide, to, 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 to create some kind of foundation for negotiating difference some kind of foundation for conviviality or, or, or living, living together. Maybe different communities, Armenians, uh, Jews, uh, and Muslims, they actually live together. 
in a hierarchical way, but, but, but nevertheless, in those years, it was as actually when we look at the situation in the Middle East right now, we appreciate the, the, the Ottoman effort to, to create some kind of management of, 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 of you know, living together in, in, the, in those, actually, uh, in those years. And the heydays were actually the, the 16th and 17th uh, 17, uh, 17 century. Before coming to our uh, <coughs> book, the second uh, book that I read recently, uh, The Sultan and the Queen, uh, which talks about the kind of a friendship between uh, Sultan Mahmoud III in 1578. Uh, he writes a <coughs> letter to first Queen Elizabeth, first Queen Elizabeth, and at that time, of course, Elizabeth is the first uh, queen and uh, facing significant challenges, uh, mainly from uh, Spain and the other countries, and uh, wants some kind of protection and uh, as kind of, uh, you know, obnoxious or arrogance that, that the every Ottoman Sultan has, uh, the, the, the Sultan the Mahmoud III in uh, 1578 writes the first letter to Elizabeth and saying that he could uh, kind of uh, secure the existence of Elizabeth, and, and he could help uh, the Britain to, to protect itself vis-a-vis -vis the uh, mainly the Spanish uh, invasion or, or expansion. And of course, those years, uh, six months, uh, it takes uh, letter goes from Istanbul to London, and Elizabeth reads the letter and likes the letter and responds to Mount III and saying that uh, we could actually establish some kind of relation between uh, us. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, out of these uh, letters, they became friends. And as a matter of fact, uh, to uh, demonstrate this friendship that, that uh, Elizabeth, uh, the Queen, uh, uh, sort of uh, likes uh, or appreciates, uh, she wears uh, Ottoman uh, sort of earrings, bracelets, and everything. So when you look at the pictures of Elizabeth iconography, and uh, you will see the Kind of a uh, you know interaction going on, dialogue going on between uh, Queen Elizabeth and the Mount of the Three, and then uh, the Britain uh, sends the first merchants uh, to, first to Nigeria and Istanbul, the first uh, you know uh, the, the ambassador to Billy. And as a matter of fact, uh, this uh, they became friends. They continue exchanging letters and everything. And uh, but of course, this story uh, written by. Uh, Professor of Romanticism at Oxford University, the Sultan and the Queen, uh, last, last, last year, indicates that uh, Istanbul and Europe is actually extremely uh, intermingled, intertwined, and, and dialogical. On the one hand, we talk about Istanbul as a bridge between the West and the East, Oriental and the Occident, but, but as a matter of fact, the bridge metaphor is always you know, bridging over, crossing over kind of thing. But Istanbul has been a, more than a bridge. It's kind of a big historical, uh, you know, sort of interactive relation between, uh, between the two countries. That takes place at the actually uh, intersection, intersection of it. Uh, the, 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 the previous uh, British ambassador, uh, Richard, uh, our friend, uh, is a very funny guy sometimes, uh, you know, uh, calls himself as the uh, 23rd ambassador of, of Britain to Islam, but at the same time, 149 or 153 ambassadors since the first Queen Elizabeth. So, so despite the uh, stalemate between Turkey-EU relations, uh, and, and despite the uh, kind of uh, <coughs> tensions that is going on between Turkey and the West, as a matter of fact, we are talking about extremely interactive uh, history between, between actually these, these Two actors in which Istanbul plays plays a crucial, uh, crucial, uh, crucial role. And of course, uh, Istanbul, uh, by by providing a 724 culture and, and, and consumerism, and over like the nightlife, the tourism center, and everything, is also actually a, a city of postmodernity. It's not only uh, sort of history; it's not only modernity, but it's a city of postmodernity where difference pops out in different forms. Right now, as we actually did it in the book, we are not only talking about uh, you know, the, the, what we call uh, 
non-Muslim minorities, uh, which reference to the laws of treaty, but also we are talking about a white Methodist, we are talking about LGBT, uh, and, and we are talking about uh, Kurds. For instance, Turkey is a big Kurdish problem, and when we talk about the Kurdish problem, we refer to southeast and east part of Turkey, but Istanbul is the biggest uh, Kurdish city in, 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 in Turkey. And as a matter of fact, maybe the solution of the Kurdish problem to some extent in the way in which Turkey evolves is a totally urban space. Right now, 73% of Turkey is urbanized. So we are not talking about a country in which we, you know, we have a kind of a migration or we have a transition from rural to urban life. But Turkey is a very urban uh, space. And uh, <clears throat> in 2020, this uh, urbanization uh, rate uh, of, of Turkey will be around 76, 77 percent, in which case we'll talk about Turkey as purely urban uh, social formation. So, so the, the biggest uh, Kurdish city turns out to be turns out to be turns out to be Istanbul. And as a matter of fact, when we look at the tail of the urbanization of Turkey since 1960 and 70, it doesn't actually move from Istanbul, Ankara center to periphery. But uh, on the contrary, it actually moves from periphery back to back to center. We talk about new middle classes, we talk about urban cities in Anatolia, and periphery becomes modern and ur ur urbanized. And, 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 and in that in that sense, uh, most of the urbanization of Turkey, uh, you know, uh, happens in Turkey overall. But Istanbul is also kind of a miniature of Turkey because all of these modernizing peripheries, urbanizing peripheries, have some sort of correspondence in, in Istanbul. Diyarbakır is in Istanbul, Kayseri is in Istanbul, Sivas is Gaziantep is in, in, in Istanbul. Of course, uh, at the same time, uh, with respect to the recent situation in uh, Syria and Iraq and the Middle East, where we are talking about extremely tragic uh, refugee problem, uh, Turkey has uh, 4 million refugees, 3.2 million are, are, are from, from Syria, and Istanbul uh, accommodates, uh, as a matter of fact, more uh, properly absorbs uh, around 400,000 uh, Syrians registered and, and, and unregistered. So we are talking about kind of a postmodern uh, city in which a difference pops out in different, different forms, and the city regenerates and restructures itself going back and forth between uh, then and, and now and then becomes a kind of a space of uh, difference, a space of different identities claiming, 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 uh, claiming to the, to the state. We have of course uh, claims from the government in terms of, as uh, Nora said, the autonomy, this Istanbul and everything, but Istanbul resists uh, to all of these actually uh, essentialist uh, <coughs> description of, of it. Istanbul cannot be postmodern, cannot be neo-Ottoman, cannot be neo-Kemalist. Istanbul is something indifferent, peculiar, peculiar, and it always uh, defines itself. Uh, and, and is a big, uh, you know, sort of resisting uh, power. In, because of that, uh, in the forward, I said that Istanbul always rises from its ashes like Phoenix, and now maybe we are actually kind of a downturn in Istanbul, but we have the U-turn always sort of, uh, you know, rises like a, like a, like a, like a, like a Phoenix. Maybe uh, before I, our book, the third book would be uh, Orhan Pamuk's Istanbul, uh, and in that book, of course, which created, the, I think, the main reason, or one of the main reasons why he became the uh, <coughs> Nobel laureate, and uh, in, 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 in the uh, speech, uh, in the ceremony, uh, Orhan Pamuk's, uh, the justification for, for his Nobel Prize, uh, that like this, uh, he actually defined Istanbul in such a way that it was so creative that 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 it, it all happened, deserves. <coughs> of course, that creativity came from uh, Orhan Pamuk's statement that uh, Istanbul uh, provides a space that is not translatable, or, or whose main characteristics are not easy to be translatable. 
into different uh, languages. And of course, uh, it says uh, that, that when we look at Istanbul, when we breathe Istanbul, when we experience Istanbul, we experience, breathe, and feel some sense of huzun. Huzun is like a melancholy, is like a longing, is like a sorrow. But neither melancholy nor longing nor nor uh, sorrow describe huzun. You feel kind of loss because of the post-empire situation, but at the same time, you know. Uh, in the whole, uh, you know, multi-religious, multi-multi-ethnic feeling of Istanbul, you don't see that in sociology. As a matter of fact, those multi-religiosity, multiculturalism, multi-ethnicity does not really reflect on the actual uh, life of Istanbul because of the Turkification, because of the loss of, of all of these actually, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the main uh, citizens of Istanbul, uh, the late Ottoman times. And, 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 and everything. So Orhan Pamuk says Istanbul is something that is not translatable because of this uh, feeling of, 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 of history. A friend of mine, uh, through uh, photography, challenged Orhan Pamuk and uh, say that you know when you live in Istanbul, uh, you don't actually uh, sense history only. You don't always uh, you know feel melancholy and, and, and longing. As a matter of fact. The city has uh, joy, the, 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 the joyfulness of the city, which actually in Turkey call it the uh, Keyif. You know, you feel Keyif, you live Keyif in Istanbul. Keyif is kind of a joyfulness and everything. So that's also not really translatable. So, so in this sense, you might go from Yusuf to, to Keyif, two words that are not really translatable. So that also gives kind of peculiarness. Is to, to, to Istanbul. I feel that actually this kind of Istanbul goes back and forth between Hüzün and, 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 and here because of mainly because of the fact that Istanbul actually provides a space where we feel history, modernity, and then postmodernity at the same time. All of these processes, uh, these, these moments, these, uh, these uh, concepts get together uh, in, in actually Istanbul. But of course, at the same time, uh, we live in uh, neoliberal ages uh, where globalization is also becoming very urbanized. In 2030, we will be talking about globalization as urbanization. Of course, urbanization brings potentials, but at the same time, bring very, very serious risks in terms of resources, in terms of you know, conflicts, so and so forth. And Istanbul also is a very global city. It's actually uh, one of the uh, you know sort of rising global cities uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the world where we are talking about big uh, business interactions, exports, imports, multinational companies, so and so forth. As a matter of fact, uh, you know these guys actually live here in Istanbul more than us because they can afford the beauties of, of Istanbul much more than much more than much more than us. It is an affordable city, but it's also a very, very expensive city. Depend on actually like New York, like 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 London, like 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 so and, uh, and as a matter of fact, when we look at the, I uh, just actually before coming here, looking at the recent uh, figures, Istanbul uh, provides 52% uh, of Turkish exports and 43% uh, of all budget revenues of of country. So it is a very, very big asset for Turkey. If Turkey is an economically dynamic, economically vibrant country, comparing with, uh, with its actually uh, sort of the Middle East, uh, Latin America, you know, Balkans, Caucasia, and, and everything, uh, main reason is actually uh, Istanbul. Istanbul provides that. Istanbul creates this push for for economic economic uh, economic dynamism. As a matter of fact, when you look at the uh, work on global cities, uh, you know, uh, some global cities like London uh, you know, does not really actually contribute to the overall economy of Britain. We will see actually big disjunction between, between London and, and Britain. But as a matter of fact, Istanbul, like Berlin, Istanbul uh, sort of contributes to Turkish economy. So it is not actually, it is all the state in itself, but at the same time, it's the city that contributes economically 
to the economic uh, dynamism, dynamism of, 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 of Turkey. And in that sense, like uh, New York, uh, like uh, you know, Beijing, Shanghai, this is not only a city, it is a zone, it is an urban zone. We don't know where Istanbul starts and Istanbul, Istanbul ends. It actually impacts the uh, cities around Istanbul. It is one of the city region, actually. Uh, and it's a, it's a sort of an urban, urban zone. And, uh, and you feel the sort of, uh, sort of the sense and, 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 the, and the, you know, sort of smell of neoliberalism in Istanbul, too. So, so in this sense, you have actually history on the one hand, postmodernity on the other hand, global neoliberal restructuring. So it actually kind of an intersection of all of all of all of these these feelings. So, so in this sense, uh, Istanbul, as we like to do it in the book, uh, creates a laboratory like 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 Turkey. Uh, so working on Istanbul, studying Istanbul is not only studying a city or or a, or a space in a country, but also you know, studying the global trends and, and how global trends occur and what way actually these, these trends are, are going, are, are going. That's what actually we, we, we wanted uh, to do, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in Istanbul. But of course, uh, the one last thing is, uh, the last, uh, you know, uh, three, four years, uh, really, interest in three developments occurred in Istanbul, which actually uh, sort of uh, gave me and, and people like, like us uh, you know, in, in Turkey that, that you know, we actually had Istanbul and because of that uh, you know, we could be cautionary optimist about Turkey and, and its, its future. One was actually uh, you know, a couple of years ago, the Gezi movement. In that sense, uh, Istanbul it started in Istanbul. And then people actually, uh, in a Hannah Arendt uh, way, uh, you know, they said, you know, we have the right to have rights. We have the right to urban space. So the urban citizenship, you know, sort of claiming to the urban, what this David Harvey uh, puts it, we actually experienced it in Istanbul. So on the one hand, it is a kind of a, you know, uh, outcome of or, or the where we could actually see the manifestations of neoliberal globalization. But on the other hand, in the same place, we also see resistance to neoliberal globalization. And, and the people of Istanbul, mainly youth of Istanbul, said that we got the right to the city, we got the right to the urban space, and we have actually that uh, resistance which actually disseminated all over, all, over, all over Turkey. And as a matter of fact, we have studies and we have seen the kind of developments of different parts of, of the world and we could talk about global busy or, or global sort of demonstrations or the claims to third countries, to main that, so and uh, so and so forth. Of course the second one was uh, Turkey is going through a transition from parliamentary democracy to uh, some kind of executive uh, presidential system for which uh, we had uh, last year, uh, 16 of uh, April, the referendum, and Istanbul said no to referendum. In referendum, said no to the, this, this shift towards executive uh, presidentialism. And next year, we will have a local election and presidential election, first time, 2009. Maybe at the end of this year, but as legally speaking, uh, they, they are actually uh, uh, next, next year. So, so in this sense, Istanbul always, uh, you know, is always put aside vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ankara, which is the capital of, 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 of Turkey, but Istanbul is still a very important uh, space for political deliberation on, on where Turkey should go or should not, should not go. And of course, uh, Istanbul becomes extremely important. Who wins Istanbul? Uh, put actually the uh, governor of Turkey. And the referendum result was, uh, as the other uh, four, uh, not as big as Istanbul, but uh, four big cities of, of Turkey, modernizing, globalizing cities of, of Turkey, they said no to, to actually this change. We will actually see well, how it's going to actually uh, uh, sort of deliberate uh, uh, during the elections. And of course, uh, as uh, Nora said, uh, uh, you know, almost two years ago, we had a coup attempt. Uh, and, and interestingly, uh, this coup attempt uh, started Ankara and Istanbul. And the main resistance uh, to the coup attempt happened 
in Istanbul, and Istanbul turned out to be a symbol of, uh, you know, sort of resistance against uh, this uh, extra-democratic uh, or extra-parliamentary interventions into the, into, the, into, the, into the politics. So, so in this sense, uh, you know, we are talking about the city, as I said, uh, which is kind of a laboratory for, 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 for thinking about, you know, uh, all of these actually uh, developments uh, in the world politically, economically, sociologically, from, from society to, to, to everyday, everyday, everyday life. Uh, we started, uh, you know, working on this book uh, after 2010, uh, when, you know, Istanbul was uh, turned out to be or chosen as the European capital. Uh, there was delay for, for publishing the book, uh, but I was very happy for that delay because uh, if we published the book three years ago, we were not having, uh, you know, chapters for LGBT and environmentalism in Turkey, and right now they are the big issues very important serious challenges uh, to, to Turkey and Turkish democracy. So, so there we are, uh, here we are, with, with this, this book uh, which actually starts with history and ends up with today's uh, Istanbul. So we, we certainly have time for uh, questions and discussion. People are happy to answer them. Um, so I'll 